Thank you so much. Good to be ahead of schedule. Ben Brown sneaking in right on time. Good. Um, sorry to call you out. We're ahead of schedule. Anyway, I'm here representing the Google Quantum AI team, and we have a relatively new paper out we posted this summer about scaling surface codes. TP in real life uh, conference environment. So I think it's a great opportunity interruptions and Q&A, so feel free, raise your hand. We've got mics running around, and I'm not trying to cram in too much content here. What I'm trying to do is to work through basically what we have in the paper. Um, and it's really great to, to see you all, and this is a really big team effort. If you take a peek at the author list here, you'll get a flavor for that, but I want to thank everybody who is involved in this project, too, from the, the full spectrum that, that made it possible. Now, you might think, Ah, this quantum error correction stuff is a little off-brand for the NISC conference. But I was pleased to see there was a lot of good QEC content already in this conference, in addition to other stuff. I've been learning a lot sitting in here. And also, I can assure you that this experiment is going to be noisy, intermediate scale, and quantum. So we're all, we're all on the same team here. Now, that said, um, we have a, a goal that we're working towards of building qubits that have an error per operation of order like one in a billion or one in a trillion in order to run some of the algorithms that people are really interested in. And this is a far cry from what is possible with today's technology where the error per operation is more like 1% or maybe one in a thousand. And in order to cross that chasm, what we're planning to do is to build a bridge out of quantum error correction where we try to encode all of our quantum information into logical qubits and in this case, what we're focusing on is the surface code, although there are a lot of alternatives out there. And the idea here is to distribute that quantum state over here, d squared, different data qubits, so that any one or two qubits getting an error here and there, we can roll with the punches and, and overcome it. In order to get this to work, and in order to cross this bridge, we need both performance and scale. And the reason for that is there's a certain overhead associated with all this quantum error correction stuff. And if your underlying operations are not sufficiently high performance, then your bridge is basically going to just crumble under its own weight because there is too much going wrong as you go. And moreover, uh, a qubit of this size, a logical qubit of this size like distance five, isn't really what we have in mind if you want one in a billion error per cycle. What we want is to scale these qubits to be larger and larger, um, maybe distance of tens in size so that we can approach these very low logical errors. The key idea being that if the performance is good enough, as we scale up the size, that the error per logical operation should decrease exponentially. Now, testing how logical performance varies with size is the subject of this work, because it's a new regime that we're entering into now where we can test different sizes of service code logical qubits. So let's start with distance three. I love this service code logical qubit. It's made of 17 physical qubits here and any one error at a time it can handle. And there has been a lot of work recently in the literature and a variety of different platforms, including ones similar to what we're working on and ones that are rather different from what we're working on in the service code and in other related codes that I just wanted to highlight. And a special bonus mention for the Harvard group. We had a the great double feature this morning, and I really love seeing the Torrent code on a torus. That's something we can all be enthusiastic about. Um, but that being said, we want to see what happens when we scale up the size of this code. So the main enterprise here is comparing the distance three logical qubit to a distance five logical qubit, which has about three times as many physical qubits involved. It's 49 in this case. And because it's larger, it's able to basically handle any two errors at, at a time. Um, and we want to compare these because ideally, if the performance is good enough, then making it bigger should make the performance improve. And in order to implement this and test this out, we're using a new device, a Sycamore quantum processor that's scaled up to 72 qubits. And this is similar to the devices that you may have seen previous work from our group on. And this is large enough to host a, this distance five logical qubit. So here we have 25 data qubits, and they're responsible for holding on to the quantum information of the logical qubit. And then we also have 24 measure qubits, and each of those is responsible for projectively measuring a local parity or stabilizer operator. And one way to think about how this lands you on a qubit is each time you do one of those projective measurements of one of those measure qubits, you're kind of cutting the Hilbert space dimension in half, kind of dividing it in two. 
And so you start with 2 to the 25, you divide it in 2 24 times, and you're left over with this two-dimensional space, which is our logical qubit space that's shared across all of the data qubits. In order to kind of grab onto that logical state space, we use these logical operators which cross the array from one side to the other. And these have a very important property that they commute with all of those stabilizer operators, and they anti-commute with each other. And there's a lot of rich and interesting physics that goes, on to, goes into understanding how these states actually work. I'm not going to get into it right now, but we had a nice talk from Julia Semagini this morning that touched on related physics, and it was published together with, with a paper from our group as well, exploring these topological states and in this context a little bit more. But we're not going to dig too deep into that just now. Bless you. Now, you may recall from John's talk, John Martinez's talk on Monday, that these device benchmarks are really important to seeing how your device is performing. And we want to benchmark these operations simultaneously across the device so we can see if there are any deleterious effects from stray interactions or control crosstalk, things of that nature. And so this is just a quick summary of the distributions of the errors associated with each of the operations that we run on our device. In particular, the single qubit gates, where the error per operation is about one in a thousand. The control Z gates, where the average error per operation is about six times 10 to the minus three. Measurement has an average error of about 2%. And then this dynamical decoupling I'll elaborate more on uh, in a bit. Now in the service code, we're going to measure those stabilizer operators over and over again. And each time we measure one of those, that's one cycle of the service code. And we're going to do this some dozens of times in the context of today's uh, experiments. Let's look at one cycle in closer detail. And first of all, we can focus on the point of view of this measure qubit, who's responsible for talking to its four neighboring data qubits, coming up with some kind of parity, and then projectively measuring that out so that we can uh, figure out what, what's going on. And the circuit is relatively simple. It does a Hadamard, four control Z gates with its four neighbors, and then another Hadamard before being measured and reset. And if you think about this sort of most straightforwardly, this is like this measure qubit is measuring Z, 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 Z on its four neighboring qubits. And we can control what basis it's actually measuring by looking at this from the perspective of the data qubits instead. And the way that we're implementing this is we have these Hadamards in between these similar four layers of control Z gates so that each data qubit also talks to its four neighboring measure qubits. And because of the way we've arranged these Hadamards, really the operator that the measure qubits are all measuring is Z, X, X, Z. And um, the way that we implement this is with these four layers of control Z gates. And the Z, X, X, Z thing can be a source of some confusion and it's closely related to, I have Ben Brown right here, closely related to the XZZX code in the service code, for example. But there can be kind of different points of view here about um, how it all fits together. This might be a good moment if we want to have any discussion about that. Ben smiling. It can be a source, the reason it can be a source of confusion is we aren't implementing this specific ZXXZ or XZZX code in order to exploit a bias in noise, really. That's not our primary aim, although such a bias does exist. Um, our primary aim involves some simplifications in the circuit to get rid of extra Hadamards. This can be a source of some potential confusion, but it sounds like we're all on the same page. Revisiting this distribution of errors, I want to talk about this dynamical decoupling thing again, this DD which was here at a couple percent on our distribution of errors. And although it may not look like it in this diagram, this measurement and reset, which is an important part of the error correction cycle, is a majority of the time that we spend in this current implementation. It's 70% of the cycle duration. Now, we want to decrease that by making the measurement and reset faster, and that's a uh, subject of ongoing research. But in the meantime, the data qubits have to sort of sit around during that time and wait um, in order to wait for the next cycle to begin. And so that decoherence that can occur during that period of time can be a significant part of the error that the data qubits experience during the service code. And this is something that's easy to overlook if one is just doing a quick simulation of the service code. So you have to pay attention to this kind of thing if you're trying to drum up a, a threshold, for example. Um, pay attention to some of these sneaky sources of errors here. 
If we can move on from just looking at one cycle, as I said, we're going to be doing this over and over again, some dozens of times in this case. And let's take a, take a walk in the park here and explore a day in the life of a service code logical qubit. So here's our device again. We're sort of looking at this in a 3D view with time progressing to the right. And we start off by just initializing all of the data qubits into a simple state of zeros and ones. It's not entangled or anything. And those zeros and ones have some parities associated with them in one basis. So one way to think about this is that these tiles go with the Z basis, and it's like the parity of 0, 1, 0, 0 is 1. It can get a little bit subtle with this ZXXZ business, but we don't need to really worry about that in this context. So we have an initial knowledge of what the parities are in one basis, but not the other. And then we can proceed with measuring all of these stabilizers. As I mentioned, we measure all 24 of them concurrently at the same time. Um, and then the result of those stabilizers uh, can be these ones and zeros on the right-hand side of the slide. And something interesting is happening here. We started off with no entanglement across the device. But then by doing all these local measurements, these sort of local four-body measurements, we land in, we project into this interesting entangled topological state, which is the logical qubit state. Now, as we're measuring these things over and over again, things can go wrong. Errors can happen. Uh, and that's kind of the whole reason for this enterprise, is realizing that we can have you know, errors happen. And what we're trying to do is to catch them as they happen so that we can sort of figure out after the fact, or potentially as it's going on, what, what has gone wrong. So for example, consider if we have this accidental Z gate there in red on the left-hand side. And what's going to happen is it will be kind of picked up by two of the measure qubits that that qubit interacts with. And it has to do with the details of like where the Hadamards are and what the commutation relations are. But uh, just bear with me that this Z gate will cause these two uh, marked in red um, measure qubit operations to basically be flipped, the measure outcomes to be flipped relative to what you would expect them to be. And that flipping signifies the detection of something going wrong. Um, and these two appear at the same time. So you can think of them as a space-like pair, for example. Similarly, we could have an error happen to a measure qubit, for example, in the measurement, or you can think of it like an X gate right before the measurement. And this will lead to kind of getting the wrong answer here. And then you go back to getting the right answer again, but it's also changed relative to the previous cycle. So you can get these two detections that are now separated in, in time. You can call that like a time-like uh, edge. Or if you have an error that happens like in the middle of the CZs, several interesting things can happen, and this is one example of them, where it gets detected by one of the neighboring measure qubits immediately, but the next measure qubit we had kind of already talked to before the error happened, so we don't see it until the next cycle. So you can see these various uh, interesting ways that these errors can, these detections can pair up, manifesting from individual errors. You can also consider, like, if you had a lot of errors happening, then these things would kind of overlap, and it could get a little bit confusing. At the end of the day, we want to measure out this logical information, because basically we're playing a game here where we try to encode a logical bit, and we want to hold on to it for a period of time, and then measure it at the end and see if we get what we thought we were supposed to. And the way that we do that logical measurement is by simply measuring all of the data qubits. This is kind of the opposite of the initialization, where we end up with a final state we're projecting each qubit uh, and just getting some ones and zeros out at the end. And similarly to that, we can infer parities in one basis based on these bit strings. We can infer these parities. And that's important because it allows you to see if you maybe made a mistake, you had a measurement error in one of your data qubits there at the very end. Now, with all of this information in hand, the decoding problem is basically taking all of these different detection events and analyzing that whole history to, to ask, do we think that some errors happened that flipped one of our logical operators? And so we can then look back over and try to correct whatever logical operator we sort of naively get here to, to arrive at a corrected logical operator. And the success criterion here is, of course, that that measurement at the end agrees with what you put in at the beginning. And you can repeat this experiment thousands of times in order to get some statistics and see what's the probability that you're getting, a, getting success here. And this process of logical memory holding onto a logical qubit is the core technical challenge of running the surface code. There's more to it, of course. We want to do other operations like doing logical C-naughts and T-gates and so on. 
And those have their own complications, but they're mostly involving changes at the boundaries of the logical qubits. And if you can do a good job at memory, I think you're going to be in good shape for the rest of the requirements for the surface code. We're going to get into data now. So if there are any kind of big picture thoughts and questions, it's a good moment for it. We can always get to it at the end too. Okay, let's get to some data because we did this in real life. It was not easy, but I was very excited uh, to, to get this data. And before we get into all this logical stuff, we want to look at the detection probabilities. Um, and this is sort of a, a simpler form of data. It's where all those colored zeros and ones were. Um, and this gives us a signal of where in space and time errors are tending to happen in the course of our experiment. So in this example, we have a distance five service code experiment. We run it for 25 rounds, and then we can uh, plot a line for each of the measure qubits. What fraction of the time did it get a detection event averaged over some thousands of repetitions? And it makes sense to split these into two groups. Weight two, we have like in the lighter blue, and weight four in the darker blue, that's the boundary and the bulk, respectively. And at the boundary, the measure qubits are only talking to two data qubits, so they tend to detect fewer errors, basically. Um, and here, this plot is averaging for each of the measure qubits looking from t equals 1 to 24. There are some boundary effects at t equals 0 and 25 because those detections are based on inferred parities from the data qubits. So in this case, we tend to observe fewer detections for those, and they're not part of this average. One important observation here is that these detection probabilities are slightly increasing over the course of the experiment. This is not a good thing. Um, quantitatively, it's about a 12% increase over these 25 cycles, and it sort of fits to a, an exponential settling time of about five cycles. We attribute this to leakage so that the qubit states are slightly leaving the computational states into non-computational states. Uh, which can um, really confuse the error correction circuits. And this is a problem that we need to mitigate head on. And I'll note here, we don't discard any repetitions in these experiments. You'll see in some papers, they, they'll um, discard the data where they detect leakage, but we're leaving it all in here because this is a problem that we need to address head on. So this is the distance five code. We can also compare it to some distance four codes. Now, this is a little subtle. The whole purpose of this experiment is we want to compare a distance three code to a distance five code and see how scaling is doing for us. But in a real device like this, there are inhomogeneities across the device. Like you'll see, uh, the left side is kind of doing worse than the right side. Whereas in like an ideal experiment, you would want probably like a uniform error model across a distance three and just grow it to distance five and compare those two. So to best approximate that, what we've tried to do here is look at these four quadrants that cover the distance five code, but with minimal overlap. And then we'll mostly take the average over those four codes. But in this case, we can look at the four separately and you can see a similarity uh, between the like hot spots and the distance five and the distance fours. And a reasonably similar behavior here, we're plotting all four of the distance three codes uh, together on the same axes and see that it's reasonably similar. Actually, the detections in the distance three are a little bit smaller and that could be attributed to a little bit less leakage, a little bit less stray interactions or crosstalk happening when you're doing fewer operations at once. But it's very similar behavior. And that means that it's suitable for us to start comparing their logical performance. What, what, what's PD? Ah, sorry. PD is this detection probability. The question was, what is PD? And PD is the detection probability. That is, uh, in the context of this heat map, for each measure qubit averaging over cycle 1 to 24 and the thousands of repetitions, what fraction of experiments did it detect uh, an error? Or what fraction of cycles did it detect an error? We want that to be small. It would be nice if that were like 0 0.1, 0 0.05, you know, but we're got to start somewhere. We can also compare to a simulation. It's very nice to have a good simulation of your system because then you can play around. We'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more later. You can play around with changing parameters and see what you, what you want to try to fix the most and try to understand what's going wrong. And this is a simulation. I'm not going to go too deep into the details, but it's basically we have poly errors and then we add onto that some leakage and stray interactions in a fairly, say, semi-classical uh, simulation and see reasonably good agreement, including increasing in detections over the course of the experiment, which again, we attribute primarily to leakage, which can stick around for some microseconds. 
Good. With the detection stuff um, taken care of, we can move on to the logical performance. Um, so this is not just looking at these individual detections, we're looking at each experiment as a success or failure after decoding. Um, and let's kind of walk through what we have plotted here. So we're looking at the distance five in blue, and then each of the distance three codes is in pink, and we can average over them in red. It's all plotted there. The upper plot is looking at the logical error probability, the probability you get the wrong answer, as a function of how long the experiment was from one to 25 cycles. And so this we want to start at zero, because at the beginning you should kind of have your act together. And then over time we're expecting this to saturate up to 0 0.5, which is just a coin flip, where if you've gone deep enough, uh, everything, everything is lost. And a good mental model here is like each time you do a cycle, there's some probability that you accidentally flip the logical operator of order a few percent in this case. Um, looking at the logical error probabilities themselves as sort of the figure of, as one figure of merit, uh, we can first look at this t equals one data point. And you notice this is not taken into this fit here. That's because t equals one is sort of a special place where there's no storied history of bad stuff that have happened to the qubits so far. So the distance five code is really at a greater advantage at, at that point because um, there are fewer errors happening. It's like the threshold is easier, sort of. And so at this point, the distance five code has half the error of any of the distance three codes, um, and it's really doing well. As things go on, we do longer and longer experiments. Um, the distance five is consistently lower than the average of all the distance threes, although it's true that there are a couple of these pink triangles kind of peaking close by uh, that can be some close calls there. Some of the pink triangles are under the, the pentagons. So that's one metric we can look at is just this logical error probability. And it's good that distance five is better, lower error is better here, uh, though it's only a little bit. Another good metric is this logical error per cycle. And in our mental model of like flipping a coin each cycle to have some few percent probability of making a mistake, that's basically what this number is looking at. And so we can fit a curve to, th to this data. Actually, I want to address this logical fidelity, which is one minus two times the logical error probability. This is a nice quantity because it starts at one and it exponentially decays to zero. So if we plot it on a semi-log plot like this, you get a nice line, which is what the data looks like. So I think this is a really good way to look at um, data like this. And because of what I mentioned with the first couple of cycles kind of being easier for the bigger code, it's sort of not fair to include them in the fit. Like it makes our number look better, more better, but it makes the quality of the fit worse. So we leave out the first couple of cycles and just fit, actually we're fitting a line to these data in order to get these uh, rates basically out of it. And here the distance five is modestly better, a few percent better than the average of the distance threes. Another consideration here just to mention is for this uncertainty. There are some subtleties in this analysis. You don't wanna just do the statistical uncertainty because those error bars are always kind of unreasonably small. And you can see that there are some kind of fluctuations around the ideal model, which are much greater than what you would expect just from statistics, because there are thousands and thousands of repetitions going into this uh, plot. And so we can model fluctuations in these error per cycle numbers that happen over the course of the experiment, which is like roughly an hour long to take this whole data set in order to inform these error bars a little bit better. There are a few more best practices that I wanted to highlight while we're here looking at, looking at the, these plots. First is going to a large number of cycles. Here we're going up to 25, which is I think the most, most I've seen around. Um, and that's good because we're really starting to approach this, like we're over 40% error, we're getting pretty close to a coin flip in terms of logical error per cycle as opposed to just focusing on the beginning, because at the beginning, the bigger codes are at an advantage, and some of these more sneaky effects like leakage haven't had a, had a chance to manifest themselves yet. So we want to we want to force ourselves to deal with leakage. Another way to do that is by not discarding any repetitions. So we're holding on to all of the data here. Um, really getting into the weeds a little bit more. Uh, remember, we started with this initial state of zeros and ones. If you just start with all zeros, then you're biasing your initial parities to be, half of your initial parities to be zero at the beginning. And that also tends to be lower error. So in order to get rid of another kind of effect like that, we wanna randomize the initial states and, and average over those random states. 
Finally, when we're taking all these data points, we interleave between all of the codes, so it's not like we have a distance five and then the distance three, we, we interleave them all together and we shuffle the order in which these time points occur so that any systematics that you see get kind of randomized out. And we thought those are good practices to highlight that we would encourage folks to continue refining and adopting. Last thing here, I think we can address our model. We can use our model in order to generate um, simulated data and uh, do the decoding in the same way and so forth. And we see reasonably good agreement, but it's not perfect. And the discrepancy is greater for the larger code, which could again be related to perhaps there being more leakage in the larger code or more stray interactions happening. Good. Now, this is not something where we just like plugged it in and it all worked perfectly right away. Uh, this was a journey in order to get this experiment to work as well as it did. And those system improvements were hard won. There were a lot of things that we worked on. Um, we have an example list here looking at the gates, making that data qubit idle much better, like studying what kind of dynamical decoupling sequence to use and so forth. Um, doing the compilation of the circuit better. An example of that was this ZXXZ kind of compilation and inserting extra echo gates into it, which I didn't get into before, but you can ask about. And finally, in the decoding, and there's a lot that goes into the decoding, and you can squeeze out some extra performance by using um, more sophisticated um, decoding algorithms. That's another subject we can talk about. I don't have it in depth in this presentation. but. We did those improvements and we improved things over time and that was all good, but then retrospectively, it's very interesting to look at the logical performance and how distance five and distance three improved relative to each other. And that's what we're plotting here. We're looking at distance three success per cycle, uh, that way the plot goes up and to the right, okay? And distance five success per cycle. And you'll notice a slope here. This is about a slope of two. That is, the distance five code improved about twice as fast as the distance three code as we made all of these calibrations and experimental details better. And we just made it over this line here so that distance five is modestly better than distance three. But I would hope that this will continue as we continue to improve our devices and experimental techniques. Now, there's one more thing that I wanna address, a different experiment, which is repetition codes. So, uh, you can learn more about this in a paper from a year or so ago, um, but these are kind of a one-dimensional, easy mode version of the surface code. And it's not a real logical qubit, but it allows us to test a similar algorithm and larger code distances um, in the devices that we have today. So for example, we're looking at this kind of snaking one-dimensional code that covers exactly the same qubits that we're using in the distance five surface code but now it's a distance 25 repetition code. And if we plot our logical error per cycle as a function of code distance, we can first of all look at our surface code points and like, okay, well the distance five is like a little better than the distance three, but you can't even see it on this plot, okay. But the repetition code is much easier to do. So it's like threshold is easier to achieve and we're well better than that threshold. And so as we increase the code distance, we can see that this logical error per cycle is decreasing exponentially, which is what you want to see in the surface code eventually. But something is going wrong over here. What, so what, what's up with that? And actually there's one specific thing that was happening in this experiment, which was some kind of high energy event, like colloquially you could call it a cosmic ray, although it might not actually be a cosmic ray, it might be some other high energy thing. For more information about that, check out this paper. And there was one event that happened in this data set, which is about average. Each data set has about one of these every several seconds, I think. Um, and it caused a spike in detections. That's what's in this dashed line, is we were seeing like 10% detection probabilities on all the measure qubits. And then suddenly, abruptly, we had this big spike up to 40% that then tailed off with some time constant of some 10 milliseconds or so. And at the same time, we can see that the logical error probabilities also spiked up. So this is a little bit tricky to understand because this experiment is one 50 cycle experiment of a distance 25 repetition code. Um, and so by the time you go out to 50 cycles, if the error per cycle is several percent, you're gonna see a 50-50. So it's, we can't resolve exactly what's going on at the several percent level, but then after some milliseconds, the things start to chill out and the code is improving again and the bigger code improves much faster than the smaller codes, which I thought was very interesting to see. 
And this points to, uh, in addition to leakage as a very important issue that I was um, highlighting before, these high energy events are also a very important issue. And we need some hardware mitigation for this because these kinds of large scale correlated errors are total logical qubit killers. Um, but we have ongoing research and a lot of folks in the community have ongoing research to understand these better and mitigate them. Moreover, these repetition codes, which allow us to explore lower error regimes today with today's hardware, are potentially a very interesting tool to continue exploring these low, low error regimes like one in a trillion and figure out, well, what else is lurking in the shadows when we're trying to do that? And I think if we can find those mechanisms in the near future, instead of when we have our, you know, a thousand qubit logical qubit devices in the future, further off future, that may help direct our, our research in the community to figure out what we need to fix. Now, if we trim out this data after the fact, the exponential decay continues down and we're seeing about uh, certainly under one in a million error per cycle here, which is pretty cool. But again, it's not a quantum code. It's a kind of protecting a classical bit. We're doing similar operations to what we do in the service code. So, these uh, experiments, we were looking at the scaling of service code logical performance. And what we saw was we're performing well enough that distance three and distance five are about the same. Distance five is a little bit better. This means that we're starting to tiptoe around the threshold regime of the uh, service code. But it turns out that threshold is a subtle concept because there are finite size effects that can make uh, making claims here a little bit tricky. So I, in this context, in this meeting, I just wanted to illuminate this a little bit. Now let's do some poly simulations, nice simple simulations, very fast. We can take tons of statistics and get really nice low noise plots here. And the vertical axis here is going to be a scale factor on the error model that we extracted from our device. This is like those histograms at the very beginning of the presentation. And we're just going to scale that up and down and run a bunch of surface code simulations on those models and figure out what the logical error per cycle is for various code distances. And this is kind of a contour plot of that. Um, and the plot on the right is horizontal cuts through that. So there is a, a regime where we have relatively high error, higher than the error that, that we have measured, for example, where bigger is worse. You know, the bridge is crumbling, all the extra stuff is not worthwhile, and just making the code larger actually makes the performance much worse. There's an interesting regime in the middle where bigger is better to a point but eventually it turns around again. And this is probably where our experiment lies because distance five is just a little bit better than distance three. We expect that if you continued scaling it up at that level of performance, things would turn around um, in a bad way. Uh, but eventually if the performance is somewhat better, then the error per round should continue to decrease with code distance until you reach the algorithmically relevant error per cycle that you're looking for. So this concept of this sort of crossover regime, I think is something interesting to illuminate in this context of a service code experiment that's near the, near this threshold, um, which is not just a, a bright line necessarily. So maybe some subtlety in the concept. One more thing we can do with these simulations is try to budget out where is our logical error coming from. And in this case, we're using again this simulation that had poly errors and leakage and stray interactions or crosstalk. And we can use that to simulate, okay, what uh, this lambda quantity is basically the scaling quantity of as we increase the code size, how is the logical error affected? And one over lambda is basically like an error kind of figure of merit. And we can attribute some of this one over lambda to various sources of error. You can see it's like about one. We want it to be about 0.1. That would be a lambda of 10 so that increasing the code distance by two decreases your error by a factor of 10. That would be nice. And you can see there's a lot of work to do. Each of these pieces is already consuming more of the budget than that 0.1. And, and you can kind of mentally extrapolate like, okay, if we got rid of the stray interactions that happened during our control Z gates, how much of an effect would that have on this overall system metric of, of Lambda? And this is a, a nice kind of analysis using a linearization of one over Lambda as a function of these error parameters um, that, that I like to, to look at and project into the future. So let's wrap up. In this experiment, we're looking at comparing a distance three surface code to a distance five surface code. And we're excited just to do that measurement. And we're even more excited that we have a modest improvement we, when we improve the, when we increase the code size. And this is a foundational step 
but it's only the beginning of the story because again, we have these two points, you know, they're basically like the same. And really what we want as we move forward is to improve the device performance and scale so that the service code data looks more like what we have in the repetition code data where increasing the code size is exponentially reducing the logical error per cycle. And that's how we expect to get where we want to go. And we can use these budgets to inform what we need to fix, which is everything in order to make that happen, and to target what kinds of improvements we actually need to make, which we think is like roughly a factor of three to 10 in this metric of Lambda, so we have this error scaling much greater than one. And in addition to these rel relatively obvious error sources, we also have to really grapple with some of the more subtle ones, like leakage, like these high energy events or cosmic rays that I mentioned, which can be real showstoppers for logical error correction. And all the while, we want to continue testing these empirically, um, like this three versus five experiment, but at even larger and larger scales as well, so that we can hopefully observe the same kind of exponential decrease in logical error. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Uh, thanks for a nice talk. I just wanted to ask about the repetition code. Was that done like in both bases or is that in a particular basis? This one data set is just in one of the bases, but we did it in both. Mm -hmm. um, in, and in this paper, it's more focused on it. And we did it in both. For added clarity, we're doing these um, stabilizer measurements, but they're weight two. So it's operators like ZZ that we're measuring. And because the entangling gate that we're using is control Z, really the only operator that we measure is ZZ. But the basis is all kind of in your head. So what you can do is do some Hadamards around the data qubit idle during measurement period of time. So you force the data qubits to idle in a superposition state and you can be sensitive to, to errors in phase, for example. So it works for both. Cool, thanks. And maybe I could quickly ask about um, the initialization, the randomization of the initialization. Was that randomization just to sort of fairly compare the sort of benchmarking thing? Would you actually use that if you were trying to use the qubit, or would you pick like a good initial condition that gives you the least error? Good question. In this case, it's all about making a fair comparison. If you were making a quantum computer, just put them all in zero. Well, thanks. Yeah, for sure. If the high energy events are not cosmic rays, what might they be? I'm not the right one to ask. I think this paper has some hypotheses in it, but there's all kinds of crazy, all kinds of crazy possibilities. I think Matt McEwen is the graduate student who's the first author on this, uh, was saying that it's probably not cosmic rays per se, but it's some other thing. Um, what was that good news? Uh, I think it's all bad news. <laughs> I have a question about the gates. Uh, so the dynamical decoupling presumably is not necessary, right? You do it to improve things. So when you count it in your error budget, it presumably has also some good effects and also brings in some error. Do I understand that right? And somehow you have to balance those? Yes, so this is exactly right. Um, the specific dynamical decoupling that we do to the data qubits while they're waiting around is an XY4 dynamical decoupling sequence, very common. So it's just four pi pulses, basically. And you can imagine doing more pi pulses and you're trying to filter out more different frequencies of noise or whatever, or you could do fewer. Um, this was an empirical optimum. To further clarify, this bar here, labeled dynamical decoupling, it's not like the extra error due to the dynamical decoupling per se. It's more like, what is the error that the data qubits accumulate during this time when they're doing dynamical decoupling? So you could perhaps relabel that as like idle error when we're doing dynamical decoupling. That turned out to be very important to getting the thing to work. Thanks for the talk. So I have a question about this slide that you're showing. So this is a theory simulation, right? So how come you don't see a threshold in the second panel, like some flat line, right? That corresponds to some scale invariant or some crossing, right? 
Um, if you wanted to see the standard plot where you see a threshold from a bunch of lines crossing each other, that would be vertical cuts of this plot. Um, the plot on the right is horizontal cuts of the plot. And the place where that crossing happens is basically here. Those points all being at the same level of error per round as a function of distance, that's where that crossing is happening. Though this only goes out to distance 25, you know, some of these things turn around at like distance 50 or whatever, which starts to get into, I don't know, epsilontics about, yeah. Ben has one up front. I can repeat it too, yeah. What comes next? Ben asked, what comes next? Well, we need better, we need bigger. I don't know what to say. Um, uh, <laughs> well, well, first. What first? Okay, so let me tell you a few examples of things that I'm excited about. In addition to the more foundational research of improving coherence and improving our gate fidelities, that's all very important, but you don't really need to run the surface code to know that you're doing a good job at that. Things in the surface code that I'm most enthusiastic about uh, involve, for example, trying out lattice surgery. Even with today's devices, you can involve, imagine like turning on and off some stabilizers, measuring some qubits, moving stuff around to test some of those primitives. And eventually on a modestly larger device, you could start doing some actual lattice surgery on distance three logical qubits. I think that's one really cool project. And another one is dealing with yield or broken qubits. And even at like the distance five level, you can imagine like shooting out this middle physical qubit here. Because on a large device that has like thousands or a million qubits or whatever, they're not all going to work, pretty sure. So we need to be able to cope with broken qubits and there are ways that have been proposed to try to deal with this, but trying them empirically is very interesting. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I guess I have a question about the poly simulation part, so how do you exactly do that? So do you mean that you first learn the poly noise rate and do a simulation? And if that is the case, uh, how do you actually learn the poly noise or do you have some sparsity assumption of the poly noise? Or guess, because I think if you don't have any assumption, it's be really hard to uh, learn all the poly noise. Good question. Let me see how well I can answer it. So. We are curious when we run our device and we run a gate, what error is associated with each gate. And so we use randomized benchmarking techniques, randomized benchmarking, cross-entry benchmarking, whatever, on the gates operating in the simultaneous layers that we actually use in the surface code in order to see like, okay, for you know the CZ between these two while all the other CZs are going on, what's the probability that we get some poly error on them? And then the model is, since we're using these randomized benchmarking techniques, it's just depolarizing spread out over all of the relevant two poly errors. So that's like an example for a CZ. You do that for all of these different operations. You can do some benchmark to come up with some parameter. And it's obviously, you know, relatively coarse because we're not trying to get into the nitty gritty of the exact physical mechanisms going on in this context. Then you want to run a simulation. Well, you list out your circuit of all the gates that you want to run. And then after each operation, in each instance, you have some probability of tossing in an unwanted poly of a certain certain type, one or two qubits only. Um, and you run a bunch of those simulations and get some data. I'm not sure if that answered your question or not. Uh, so, so you're saying that you're basically in some kind of depolarizing model for each gate. Is that correct? Depolarizing, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um. I have a question again about these cosmic rays. Um, have you done any coincidence measurements? Like if you repeat the same experiment on two different chips in two different fridges, do you see the same event at the same time? What a fantastic idea. I think that our studies so far have been just looking at one device at a time. Okay. But if the I guess uh, a mental model might be that there's some shower of them all happening at yeah. the same time. That would be cool. I'm going to ask uh, Matt McEwen to, to check into that. Although running the experiments that, so like you can accidentally make a cosmic ray detector out of a surface code experiment or whatever, or I guess a repetition code in this case. But there are more directed measurements that you can do in order to um, measure them more precisely. Um, but they're kind of a whole thing, so. Yeah, but like if you do the, those measurements, then you don't know if the 
the type of particle that hits you, whether that specific energy is going to also have the same effect on, on your ship, right? Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. Okay. Thanks. But we have not done that. <laughs> yeah, Ben, again, I can repeat it too. Sure. Um, I, I don't know if you said too much about how CLS is affected. Can you say anything about that? You know, that's an, the, so the question was, how do TLSs affect your data? Which is referring to so-called two-level systems, which are resonant defects that qubits can interact with and, you know, steal your lunch. Um, those are pretty annoying. So when we're trying to come up with what frequencies we're going to use for these control Z gates, for example. Let me just pull this one up. We have these layers of control Z gates, and we have frequency tunable qubits that are going to resonant frequencies in order to um, exchange some energy in order to do these CZ gates. So we get to choose what frequencies for each of these, and it's a complex optimization problem, and one of the key ingredients is, what are these sad frequencies for the qubits where there's some defect in the spectrum that makes things be bad, basically makes the coherence really bad because the, this defect is stealing your energy away. So we're able to deal with uh, what we have using fairly sophisticated optimizations to these frequency selections. But what's pretty annoying is if they change uh, over time. And that can happen on, I don't know, hours time scale or something. Sometimes they just change like that. And that's pretty annoying. Um, and I'd like that fixed. That would be a very good thing for the field to continue working on. <laughs> I have a oh sorry I have a related question to this so maybe I can ask and then um, so in the CZ gate is the main error what you just mentioned or is it leakage? The main error in CZ gates is the passage of time is the decoherence, um, but there are also several other important ones. Among them are, are leakage and it's tricky to get all the calibrations just right for the simultaneous operation. There, if things go a little bit off, leakage is one of the first things to crop up. But it's like at the one in a thousand or less level per gate, so it's not like the end of the world. And another example along those lines is we can have accidental interactions between qubits that are nominally not supposed to be talking to each other, but they could kind of on accident. And then if you get a little bit entangled with your, your neighbor on accident, that shows up like decoherence as well. Hi, thanks for a nice talk. So I seem to remember a long time ago in the study of liquid helium, people actually pinned down the role of, um, of cosmic rays for in low energy physics. And I can't remember how they did that, but did they do some shielding and then um, found that the effect, which was a phase transformation, went away? Okay. It's, it's, uh, sounds like you've got a similar problem, which may have a similar solution if it is cosmic rays. This sounds relevant. If you happen to dig up those papers I'm not familiar it's, with, right, shoot me an email. It's uh, Peter Schiffer's thesis. I'll have a look. Yeah. Okay. Any last question? Okay, if not, let's thank Kevin again and uh, go for Thanks very much. <laughs>